Scott County, providing safe, healthy, and livable communities. Six point one on the agenda. Every month we uh, receive information on a different area of um, endeavor in Scott County. This month, I think, Ms. Harder, you're going to be talking about early literacy. That's the topic for today. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, yes, we're going to talk about Uh, a rich panel of people here that are going to speak with us this morning, um, which I think is um, a nice statement about the commitment we have to early literacy in Scott County. I also think it begs some questions when we talk about aligning resources and making sure that we're all pulling together in the same direction. So we'll have some of those conversations this morning. Uh, I received the results from the most recent resident survey after the packet was delivered to all of you. But I just wanted to pull out a couple of things that I thought were relevant to the conversation today. So in that survey, which you will all receive a copy of if you have not already, um, nine out of 10 people who responded to the survey said they thought Scott County was a good place to raise their children. Nine out of 10 said that access to excellent schools and education was one of the things they valued most and a place where they saw Scott County making progress towards livable communities. Um, the themes about supporting children run through the findings of that survey, so that, that priority on children comes up um, throughout the report. And 57% of the people that responded um, said that they had some level of concern about whether or not kids could read at third grade. So they were asked to rank um, their concern from no concern, mild, moderate, severe concern, don't know. And 57% had some level of concern about making sure that kids could read at third grade. So the topic is important to our citizens. It's important to our communities. We're really happy to have all of you with us today. I'd like to ask the people, the facilitators, to introduce themselves and uh, what part of the organization you're from. Then we're gonna ask the first tier of people here at the table to introduce yourselves and what your role is. And then we're gonna jump right into talking about um, early childhood screenings. Thank you. Um, I'm Paula Gustafson. I'm a business relationship manager that works in the community services division. I'm Cindy Geis and I'm the community services director. Tony Winnicke, county engineer in transportation services. I'm Erin Metoxen, Early Learning Coordinator from Prior Lake Savage Schools. Hi, Crystal Boyachko, the Family Resource Center Coordinator. I'm Mary Kay Stevens, Public Health Supervisor in the Family Health Area, Scott County Public Health. Marlene Huerta Panko, one of the Community Outreach Officers and uh, LLE Coordinator. Allie Addison, Scott County Libraries with Learning and Outreach in the Reed Mobile. Stacy Renners, branch manager at the Scott County Library, Savage. Jennifer Schultz, um, Office of Management and Budget, which really doesn't fit with the rest of this, except <laughs> I've served as the role as the co-facilitator for the LLE Ed Prep Group since it began. All right, and we have folks in the second row who may respond to questions. We'll ask them to introduce yourselves as you respond. Um, but I think that um, what I'd like to do is get going. I do want to note um, that we're really pleased to have Erin here from the school district, and um, we are going to try really hard not to make you speak on behalf of all schools everywhere today. Um, but we are just very grateful that you're here. Thank you for coming. All right. Uh, I wonder if we could start actually on the very last page of the packet, uh, page 21. Uh, and I'd like to, to direct the first question to um, Mary Kay and to Marlene. And could you talk about this data looks at the association between early childhood screenings and third grade proficiency, <coughs> third grade reading proficiency? Could you walk us through this data and, and explain uh, the relevance? Sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is some updated data that was recently compiled by. Uh, Dina Erickson, our data planner in public health, and she's available online for additional questions too with us today. So this was taking a look at the relationship of uh, when kids were screened for early childhood screening and their third grade reading levels. 
And what it found was that as kids were, when kids were screened earlier at age three, their third grade reading levels were higher, were increased. Those rates of um, reading were higher. And for kids who weren't screened until a little bit later, until five or so, there was a correlation with their third grade reading levels being less or decreased. And this, this association, I think, is really important to note that with the age three screening rates, the relationship was even stronger, so the correlation was even closer for those that were screened at age three. Um, their proficiency in third grade was a lot stronger and, and just more uh, visible with the relationship versus the ones that were screened at age five. The relationship is still there, but it's a little bit weaker. So that kind of suggests that, you know, that, that target at age three is really important for that proficiency at third grade reading. Mr. Chair, if I could ask a question, I'm worried that I'll lose this if I don't ask it now. Um, you know, when that kind of correlation and statistic is mentioned, you, you have to ask why, I think, because is the screen population kids, does that represent families where they're more engaged, more the parents are more engaged and, and more, um, is it more of a family d d dynamic that plays a role in higher screening level? Or is it something you do as a result of screening that you find issues you find um, as a result of screening? Do you do something different with indicators that are going to show a problem in the future? Do you take some kind of action starting at three? I guess I'm, I'm wondering about the correlation there. I think it's fair to say that both are probably true um, for all the stressors and reasons that families might not engage in screening early. Uh, that could be a percentage as well as when kids are screened and identified with concerns, we have the opportunity to bring in the supports to the child and the parents to help them increase their readiness and, and identify any needs they might have as they start the school process or prior. I think it's both. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and before we move on from this topic, can, can you tell us a little bit about how you believe some of your programs will impact those, maybe one or two examples of how your programs impact someone who's screened at the age of three that may need some programs to, to get to that literacy level that you need at, at age, or at third grade. And anyone on the panel can answer. Take it down. The state requires us to screen um, students between three and five years old. A lot of times parents wait until kindergarten because it's required for kindergarten. So it's not required at three. Um, the other thing we've been talking about with our team is we're finding that a lot of doctors aren't referring and hospitals can refer. So parents can't always make it to school. So we're trying to work, we've been working a lot with partnering with the county to say where else can we do screening that makes it um, accessible to families. Uh, things that come out of screening might be referrals to special education, so early intervention is what we find that if we get kids in earlier, we exit them quicker. We also can refer to programming within our districts, um, and we can refer to programming within the county and in the state. So there's a lot of resources that we do access and that we partner together on that come out of screening. So the earlier we screen, the earlier we can refer families for services. And I'll follow up on that on page nine, if you turn to that one as well. And I think this kind of goes through several different slides and, and the importance of that and the, and the benefits of that. So in some sense, you can look at Scott County and statewide having an uptick and certain communities having an uptick as well over the last 10 years and then others being flat or even going down. So speak a little bit about that and how you get the message out to those parents and understanding the importance of having that screening. So there'll be continual uptick in all of the communities. Are you referring to how we get messages out to families? Yeah. So, yeah. so we use our census data in the, in the school districts, and so we kind of reach out to our families and send reminders. We advertise it as much as we can to get families to come in. Um, and then when they're coming in, we try to set up appointments and screen throughout the year. So we probably average around 600 students that we screen a year. That's just in our school district. So that can be across school districts. You don't have to be screened in your home district. You can be screened in any school district um, doctor's office. And um, I think the county is doing some too. So MDH. So we, there's a lot of places children can be screened. Um, 
oftentimes families think it's um, a great way to see where my kid is at versus are there services that we could access. So I think sometimes it's, it's not knowing what services screening will give to you versus why we screen. It's not to make us eligible for kindergarten. Hi, I'm, the, I'm Suzanne Ernst, I'm the Child Welfare Manager, and I think from a system level, the partnership between the county and the different programming, so we know that I will let library folks talk about it, but we've got Read Mobiles, we've got Family Resource Centers, and we've got partnerships with schools that are really focused on how do we get information out to families. I think as the county continues to talk about how are we moving interventions and supports upstream, it is about how do we meet families at the earliest point possible and get them information. So again, we were fortunate with a donation um, for tablets that we were able to help support that out of the Family Resource Center. Um, and again, and then in partnership with the library and other early literacy programming. I think one thing that came out of one of these panels a few years ago is trying to come up with a single unified message to come from the county on promoting screening that we could use in marketing, not only for Live, Learn, Earn, but also on the <coughs> Readmobile in library marketing for summer reading and early literacy classes to make it just easily accessible. And so we have graphics that are were designed and that we all use to promote screening. And you can really see that tick between 2018 and 2019, ignoring the deviation of 2020. But again, in 2021, as we begin to see more families and just having that information made available does play a key role, I think, because you do see a consolidated message that everyone is able to use. And just to piggyback on that, that was one of the initial um, initiatives of LLE was to get out that information, that universal information across the board to all schools with the same flyer. In fact, we actually uh, made that flyer along with the Readmobile. They have very similar graphics with the hopes that people would see that Readmobile and those graphics and tie those two together. And um, I think certainly schools are still using those flyers. Um, we did those in multiple languages as well to try to make sure that that word was getting out um, to all of our children. I can expand on that a bit too. So. I think it's safe to say amongst all of our partners, but certainly in, in public health, it's that, that information, that campaign is integrated into all of our contacts with families. It's in our resource guides. We're talking about it on family home visiting visits. It goes out to every family in the follow along program. It's at community outreach events at the family resource center. So we're working hard to make sure that the word is out so that parents understand how important this is um, at the three year age to start thinking about that. And I think, too, to add to that as well, um, one of the ways that I've helped kind of engage that, too, and following up with some of the messaging with the screenings is really trying to appeal to the cultural perspective of some of these parents and why it is that, you know, people want to come to Scott County, to Minnesota, to kind of have that educational um, opportunity. And so how do we engage some of those cultural um, just priorities for families to kind of get them to be engaged as well, and so kind of formatting some of the screening flyers to do so. I just have a, a, a question on the same slide. When I look back from 2012 through 2021, so not even just last few years, but in 2012, from 2012, we seem to take a, a dip almost collectively across almost all these school districts, and then we started ramping back up. And so there's been initiatives by some school districts that seem to be a little bit more aggressive to try to meet the goal of getting these kids screened and getting them services that they need if they're, if they're falling behind already. But not all schools are collectively pursuing that. Again, looking at the, the, the variety of ranges of where they're at today, not only that, but as we continue to look at this and say, well, and, and then as we look at Scott County internally, how do we, how do we compare on, on the, on the, on the average uh, for the nation, for the country. And if somebody is really exceeding what Scott County is doing, what are they doing so differently that makes them more successful than we are today? Or and how do we incentivize some of these school districts that are still lagging in their percentage of accomplishing the goal of getting these kids screened? What are we doing collectively to try to get more people uh, to take advantage of this, of this service? Well, I believe one thing, and Rocky, you may have some things to add to that, but is going to the districts to discover 
um, what, what their challenges are, what their barriers are, what opportunities they see in, unique to their community. There's some things that I think we've learned district specific about where efforts can be focused and targeted and that we're having those conversations and, and growing our efforts to work with them to address that. Um, I can't speak to the national um, <coughs> level and rates, but I'm certain that's data we could get to kind of paint that larger picture. Yeah, I was I was doing some self research and I saw some districts really really being successful up in that 70 80 not in this state but in different states and I'm like gosh I would love to know what they're doing that we're not that they achieve just a really a, a lot better outcome than we are today so curious I have heard that one oh go ahead Hi, I'm Rocky Sotatani with Scott County Public Health. I'm a community health specialist with the Family Health Programs. Thank you. Um, I can't speak to all districts in the nation by any means. My background is in Head Starts across the nation, however, and in several different areas I worked in, the schools facilitated the early childhood screenings within the classroom setting. So we don't have that opportunity with all of our preschool programs here, but our Head Starts do work with our districts to facilitate those early childhood screenings during school hours for parents that can't come in at a separate time. So there's a lot of variation as to why there might be higher percentages and lower percentages even with our own districts, number of children in that district, number of screeners we have available. So that's something we're working on at a county level is to provide extra screening supports for districts that are maybe overwhelmed or provide throughout the summer. So summertime is a time that the screenings also go down. We know that just due to staffing, due to buildings being remodeled during summer. So anything we can do to support that, we're working on kind of brainstorming and supporting. Is that okay? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say um, over the experience with LLE and our discussions at different times, we um, had multiple conversations with the schools. And while I think they all potentially have some different challenges in getting those um, screenings um, done, certainly there's a universal belief that um, screening at three is uh, much more beneficial to kids than waiting until right before they go into school. I don't think that message is different across our schools. I just think the each of our district is very different and they have their own set of barriers um, in terms of getting that done. I think some of that is just even knowing the people in their districts and how to access those folks as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done some, um, public health has certainly started some initiatives to do some data sharing, which I think is a, um, another really important step, at least in our Shakopee district, where um, uh, the schools then maybe will have access to some of those kids earlier than right before they come into school. So again, I think, at least what I've heard, if the belief is exactly the same, how accessing those families can be um, in our different districts that look very different. Mr. Chair, if I can ask you, Commissioner Olbert. I'm just wondering if you had some kind of an incentive where if a child came in for screening, they got a, a packet of stuff that would help them develop as a reader, early reader, you know, packet of books or packet of whatever. I don't know what it would be, but something that they would get and they take home and other families say, well, that's really neat. Where'd you get that? Well, we got that free for screening. Uh, and then, and then I'm not, and I wouldn't say have the same thing, but have say six different variants of the same thing. Um, so that there becomes an in you know, voluntary lending library among kids and their friends. So if but your packet's different, but you got different books than I do, let's trade. I, we're finished with these. I don't know. What what would an incentive program do, do you think? Well, if I an excellent idea and a good time to jump in to talk about the screen for kindergarten tablet giveaway. <coughs> came initially from the LLE work groups and conversations and was a partnership between the libraries and public health and the family resource centers and the school districts to uh, raise awareness of the importance of screen screenings before kindergarten and, um, and by giving children uh, tablets. So they received Amazon Fire tablets. Um, if the families came into the family resource center spaces, um, shared information uh, about themselves, uh, contact information that then could be shared with the school districts, and we scheduled the screening appointments on the spot. Uh, we were also able to 
uh, talk about the early childhood screenings, what's involved with the vision and hearing um, components, the fine motor and language um, and um, gross motor components, <coughs> skills, and talk about that referral process. Like if, um, if there were uh, additional services that might be beneficial, where they might go in the community for those resources. Um, so with that table the way we, I'm gonna jump to it's page 17 in the packet. We reached uh, approximately 250 children. Um, 153 of those were directly for early childhood screening appointments and an additional 95 for referrals to community organizations. And um, that meant that they had already completed their screenings. Um, anecdotally, I could say that there were a good number of families where there were four, when the number where we actually helped complete the kindergarten um, enrollment applications on the spot. So it was just incredibly beneficial in helping to build that bridge to schools and to additional community services. <coughs> well, just a question on that. Boy, that that's sure. more expensive than I was thinking. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> but I mean, is it sustainable? I mean, you, you, and, and with across the numbers you're trying to reach. Sure, this was a <coughs> generous donation from private donors. Yeah, I know. Um, collectively, we have talked about book bags or other um, more financially, I guess, <laughs> feasible incentives that would help, again, just really leverage the shared communication that happens across uh, the districts with screenings and um, leverage all the great programs and resources that are available to families. So really the key is helping raise that awareness. I think it's also important, and I know this is, um, it's a tough conversation, but um, for screening, it's a mandate by the state and it goes through education and it funds through community education. It's underfunded. So districts can only screen the staff that they can fund. And so it's an underfunded area. It's, it keeps coming up in legislation that it's not funded enough. So you can only hire so many screeners because where is the money gonna come from? And I think the bigger, that's the bigger issue is there's no money behind it. So we get more money for all the three-year-olds we screen. So our incentive is to screen three-year-olds, but it's still what 50 bucks a kid is, isn't gonna go very far for hiring staff to do screening. Question for you. you. You said it was a state mandate that three-year-olds be screened. Uh, explain who, where the re, uh, responsibility falls and who that mandate is on. So the, it's a state mandate for early childhood screening for all kids to be screened to get into school. Um, not all kids get screened into school. So um, That's what I mean. Who's, yep. So we, we target three-year-olds four-year-olds, five-year-olds. So if they're in our preschools, we can screen them. We have 90 days within our preschools, especially if they're in VPK, school readiness, or um, certain programming. We have mandates for grants, so we have to do that within 90 days of the school year starting. Once they're in kindergarten, we have 30 days to get all of our students screened at the school district levels. That money all goes through community ed, and it's in state statute. So the funding is, the mandate's from the state department down through the school districts. So the mandate is on the school districts to do it, not the parents to bring their three-year-olds in. Correct. The mandate's That's on the school district, yes. Okay. Uh, Follow-up question then would be, um, it flew right out of my head, and I'll think of it and bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> the mandate's on the school districts then. Friendo. Erin, can I ask you, because we've had this conversation internally often about um, you know, we know for a while screening stopped in, in response to the pandemic and there were backlogs and all that kind of thing. And, and you just, I think, really eloquently explained the challenge of, of staffing there. Are there other people, like if we had public health nursing doing screenings, is that like, are there other people in the world that can do these screenings or does it have to be school people? Uh, the state of Minnesota says it's, it, it, we can have volunteers and we can have other people. It's okay. a lot to manage, so in the school districts, and, and I have to be honest, I've been in my position a year and a half, so I'm not the expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, school districts have to manage that and coordinate that, um, but you can bring in volunteers and do that. Other states, so when you talk about why other states do it better, I'll give you, Wisconsin does it through um, their YMCAs and through their, it doesn't go through their birth to three, which is in the school, so it's not at the school level, it's at the state level. So it's just different from state to state. Thank you. And Chris, in addition, we do have some staff going to training very soon. 
from public health. What's the vision for that? <coughs> Potentially to fill any gaps and support our districts where it might be needed. And Rocky, am I missing anything? I would just say bridging that connection to the school, not just doing the screenings ourselves in our own home, that's not gonna help connect the kids to their school. So how do we best support the school in getting this done? Um, and how do we best support the families in connecting to that school person that is gonna now be their lead as the child moves throughout their early childhood education into kindergarten, into their like, elementary grade and beyond. So. so would you see doing those screenings through the FRCs, through the libraries, through WIC, where would those happen if someone other than the school staff were going to do that? Yes. Including <laughs> <laughs> joining the schools. That's, the school. yes. I, that's how I would view a mm -hmm. big first step is making sure the public sees us with the school. So yes, meet them where they're at, but also make sure as much as we can support their staffing needs where they are. If we can go to the school for a day in the summer and help out for, you know, offer a few options throughout the summer or offer a weekend here or there or an evening here or there that they may not be able to on their own staffing time, I think that's where I envision the, the biggest impact to be. If we don't need to duplicate the program, the program exists, but what we're seeing is there might be some opportunity to support and enhance your capacity to do screenings at the district level. And so we've been partnering and talking about where can we do screenings because not everybody can make it to school. So where else can we partner together that we can say what's more accessible for families and how can we meet families where they're at? And Crystal, could you just talk a little bit about the vision? It looks like there's 250 of those tablets that were given away. And I think the gift was of like around 700 tablets. So can you talk about what's the... What's the future for getting those out to kids, getting the rest of them out to kids? Well, we feel like this has been successful and a really nice way to engage with families. There are a good number of tablets remaining. Um, so we've been trying to stay in communication with school districts just to make sure that we understand their capacity to uh, complete the screening. So right now there is a pause for summer in most instances, and the scheduling is happening again with, with, with families. Um, so I would envision that we can resume this again, you know, really do another big effort with communication um, as we move to the end of the summer. Yeah. Maybe uh, moving on to, to the next level, let's go to page eight and talk about the, uh, the third grade students and reading proficiency. And this is, to me, a very key performance indicator of where kids are at and determine success moving forward. So very critical uh, performance indicator. So a couple questions, you know, it, you know, obviously it's, it's ticking downward. So, but, in, and there's a lot of tentacles with this. It's the kids themselves, it's parents, it's teachers, it's the parents as teachers, you know, all of that. So one, do the parents understand that, like how important that is by the time they're third grade. So not just, I think you made the comment about, I wanna see where my kid's at, you know, important, but, you know, critically, it's like this is where they're at and, it, and their success moving forward is dependent on this. So what do the parents know and, and how can we help the parents understand that importance? So, you know, it's not just where my kid is at, but how do we overcome that and make that more successful for that child moving forward? So I would say a lot of times it, just in a small part of the libraries is we do a lot of work through our summer reading program to encourage families and kids to continue reading throughout the summer because of that summer slump where, where their reading is lost. And so we spend a lot of time um, helping families find appropriate books, helping reluctant readers find books that will interest them to help them with their reading levels. Um, I'll, I'll piggyback on that. So every summer after the completion of the summer reading program, we ask parents two questions. They opt in, they have the ability to opt out of a survey. And every single year we ask them two questions. One is, my kids read more because they participated in summer reading and they felt more prepared for their kids to go back to school in the fall. Um, and we've asked this every single year and between 
the last time or so for last year, it was 92% agreed or strongly agreed that their children read more and 85% said that they felt their children were prepared to go back to school in fall because of participating in library programs. And that is just within the branches. We also do offsite summer reading. So reaching kids who may not make it to a library, um, we connect with the schools and provide book bundles, libraries, reading logs, small incentives for kids to continue reading while they are in summer programming at, through the schools. Um, and that's just one of the ways that we do that. We also, the library focuses on positive literacy experiences, which is a fancy way of just saying, we want kids to be able to enjoy reading and we want to make it a fun experience. So whether that's through attending a library program, something traditional, like an early literacy class or story time, or visiting the Readmobile or picking up a to-go packet, there's always a literacy component involved in what the library does. Books are kind of our, our jam, it's our bread and butter. Um, and based on the information we have, we've modified our programs. So now we do story stations to attempt to appeal to families who may not have visited the library. So they can do early literacy activities with their kids, read a book, play, develop some of those fine motor, gross motor, and cognitive skills that they'll need to be ready for school, but just on a one-on-one -on -one basis with their caregivers. And 40% of the families who are now doing story stations are families who haven't been to an early literacy program. And whether it's because their kids are just really into Paw Patrol or Encanto or Coco Melon, they're themed based off of what kids like. Um, and 96% of the parents, it's that engagement of how do you engage the caregivers. 96% say they will continue those activities outside of that one program. So it's a good way to develop that relationship. I have uh, two questions. Um kind of on the same line of how do you incentivize and get kids excited about reading. You know, I recently had an experience where I homeschooled a kid for a period of time right when COVID hit, kindergarten. It took her to the library for the first time and she thought she was in, in it's <laughs> the most wonderful thing in the world, you know, so excited. And then I had another child at home that was with me for two weeks and I made him sit at the counter and read to me while he while he, while I was making dinner, what does that mean? Tell me what that means. And he's like, no, I almost just read by myself, to myself. And I'm like, no, you're going to do that with grandma. You're going to sit here. <laughs> so listening to these two experiences, one child never been to a library and the other one who reads to himself. Yes, I take my 30 minutes and I read. I'm like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking about this, I'm like, how do, how do we get more families doing either community reading parties for kids so families, if a parent doesn't have, have the time or, you know, I'm working two jobs or whatever the situation is, how do we still expose that child to a reading environment well, that may not be in their home, but maybe it's in a neighbor's home. That's a safe place for them to go. I don't know if you've ever thought about how to start something like that. And the second thing is, is how do we incentivize our older youth who maybe want to be going into the educational career path to do uh, uh, to do learning experiences at home, and, and uh, maybe a high school child goes to another family's home. Maybe this would bridge some of that diverse gap where you have someone like me coming here and helping me read, <coughs> where parents may feel a little bit more safe with someone of of their own, you know. Uh, or it's just a, it'd be huge for uh, I think a high school sc student to know that they're helping someone be successful in school. Now, whether or not that, that's a program that exists in the high school, to say, I, I, you know, National Honor Society folks or anybody else who wants to go on an educational path. So what are those types of programs or will those types of endeavors to allow the community to all get engaged rather than having it be a responsibility of just the school or just, you know, the libraries or just the parents even sometimes? I'll just speak a little bit to what um, the libraries, uh, how we connect people um, to reading experiences. Uh, one of the things that we do is we have wagon tours, which is really fun, um, which, which invites readers to come to the library and read to a dog, a therapy dog. And sometimes they bring their friends. I had somebody at Prior Lake the other day. 
came in and brought their friends with them to read to the dog. Um, and also the opportunity to... <laughs> Um, another thing that we do uh, to engage our teens is we have our, um, what do they call it? Uh, our teen, we, had, we have had a teen advisory board who helped create programming for kids, and we also had our summer spotlight volunteer program, <laughs> which is currently discontinued, right. sadly. But, <laughs> but we look forward to having the opportunity to do that again. Um, the teens will come in and they'll help us with our programs, they'll help us set up, they'll help us with the kids while they're in the program. So we have that, that opportunity. It's smaller because we can only have I like the idea of and some of the things that we can be part of looking at is like the school phase is just um, our capacity to do and we have so many people coordinating. So one thing in addition that the library has started and it's in the, like all partnerships, it's a slow developing, um, but one thing we did that we were planning to do was to start reading group, which is a way to help parents or a caregiver help boost reading skills with children. And in 2020, Prior Lake Savage Area Schools reached out to us and those reading group packets went out to every single first grader. It happened because Prior Lake Schools reached out. We had been at the beginning of one partnership and it shifted because we lost that capacity. So the school reached out to us. It's kind of having that great communication. And if you have a partner who has the capacity and can invest, so that was one thing that the library was able to do was provide a reading group pack that was some games and just early literacy activities help boost reading skills in that school district. And those went out in one year. And we have those packets available now this summer because we had a few left. Um, so they're available to families who come into the library. It's just one way to help try and boost and foster some of those tutoring skills, whether it's through that. Another program that we're doing is connecting with uh, family child care providers. So in-home daycares to provide early literacy resources. So basically it's story time that they get to do. All of our um, child care providers uh, go through training and go through what our staff goes through our every child right to read reading. Um, and then they're able to provide regular contacts. And then they're able to provide that information to the parents. So we're passing it on through the connections that these kids have. And that's a program that we just launched this spring. Yeah. We have the hand mic, please. We get in. Um, Blanca Guzman from Scott County Library also use services and read mobile. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on Ali and Stacy. Um, I also work with a group of people called FFNs, and these are non non licensed child care providers who for many reasons don't have the training or obtain the training a regular licensed childcare provider would have. So we partner with public health and provide them with a summer bag or a winter bag with activities they can use in their, in their homes, which is where they have their kids, um, these kids to take care of. Um, and they, we also do what well, we use to do trainings um, that they requested. So early literacy trainings, because some of them do not understand the reasons of why they should be screening their kids at three. They're not the ones taking them to screen at three, but they, they have the knowledge so they can pass it on to these parents who work long hours and also pass on the information of FRC and this, their schools and the resources that the community already has. Thanks, Blanca. I wonder, I was in this boardroom a couple of weeks ago talking about the annual performance report and looking at some of the data around education and literacy, and there were some um, questions that came up that I think you all are probably in a better position to answer uh, than I was. And so one of the things is we have talked about the importance of third grade reading, and um, and much of the research would say that's indicative of success later, high school graduation, academic success. 
And yet what we see in Scott County is our graduation rates continue to go up while our screening, our third grade reading levels are actually going down. And so obviously we're not looking at that same group of kids, right? It's not yet a longitudinal study, although we're preparing for that. Um, but I wonder if you could talk about, like, what would it, what does that mean to you as, as people in the prevention and education fields? What does that mean to you that um, our high school graduation rates are high and our third grade reading levels are declining? <laughs> I guess that's me. Um, I can speak to what we're doing in Prior Lake. Uh, and so I'm new there, um, but since, um, and Lori Parker is my, my co-partner, and we work together really collaboratively. But um, most of the preschools across the state are required to take collect data. So we collect using data using TS Gold, which is um, what a lot of programs the state really pushes it. So a lot of districts do use TS Gold data, which measures where kids are falling on um, early indicators from the state. So we use that for data. We use um, creative curriculum, and we use foundation. So we're really pushing phonics again at a really early, early level, which is coming back to um, a lot of kids don't know the phonemic awareness. So really, that's a training that parents really need to, is how to help families with that. For a while, the state went with balanced literacy and really pushed balanced literacy and went away from phonics. And so that's why I think there's a gap between those years where the state was really pushing about more balanced literacy and reading and kind of went away from phonics and you need a balance of both. We can't just do all in. So um, school districts are doing a lot to kind of prep students to make sure that they're kindergarten where we partner with all of our, we're, we sit with the elementary principals and talk about what can we do to make sure students are ready. Um, there is a gap from the pandemic. We know that masks did impact our the learning of kids, once they took those masks off, we were really able to do a lot more intervention and see who's really participating and who is really holding back. So um, it's been a great find for us to see in social emotional learning definitely plays a, pull, a part in all of that. So social emotional learning, making sure that they're able to sit, able to be ready and are able to learn. Because if you're not self-regulated, you're not ready to learn. So there's a lot more to just focusing on reading. It's really making sure that we have the skills we need to be good students too. I, given that the third grade reading level is really kind of a, I don't want to say a lagging indicator, but you won't know the success of that child getting through high school to, to, for much later, and we're seeing that drop. Is there some concern, some discussion, that we are going to see a decline in our high school graduation rates given that our third grade reading levels are declining? And are there some mitigating um, programs that we can implement in order to take care of that? I know this is early literacy, but once they're in third grade, what do we do with them if they're not reading at? We've got nearly 50% that aren't reading at the level they need to be at third grade. Well, I can say for us, the discussions are, what do we need to do now so that we're not waiting for that gap to happen? So we're doing interventions now. So we do interventions, MTSS, RTI, whatever. Some people call it RTI. It's called MTSS now. Um, positive behavior interventions in early childhood, we call it pyramid. We do all the same things the schools do, and then we share that information up so that we are not just passing a student on without information. We're saying, here's the interventions we used. Here's what you can continue to do to build on those strengths. So a little different angle, but if we look at the early childhood screening rates for those of us in early childhood for, and the third grade reading levels as a mark of how have we done supporting families in early childhood. It's all about the things Ali said about supporting caregivers in those everyday moments, which are literacy, pre literacy skills, um, supporting parents with um, concrete supports or whatever kind of support they need so that they can be uh, parenting well and having those moments despite their stressors. So we have a lot invested in supporting families early on and hoping to see that some of those rates increase that they can be impacted. I've seen some studies about maternal mental health and third grade reading rates and some other things. So the more that we can um, bring this awareness to families and support families and the simple things they can do and all of our programs and things, the more that we can strengthen that. So this, it's more of an end marker. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps when kids maybe are lagging, the school system provides some opportunity for some mediation to those things before those high school um, graduation rates. But we, we look towards those as an outcome of how our family is doing coming into the school system because that foundation is laid well before they come to school in those early relationships. And we have to remember all families don't choose preschool. So there's a lot of families that start kindergarten. They don't even have to go to kindergarten. You don't have to, you can go to first grade. So we have families that choose to go to first grade. So how do we find supports for families that aren't accessing services? 
Hi, I'm Nikki Holberg, um, Community Prevention Response Supervisor. And I think one of the things we're talking about in the Family Resource Centers, too, is how we can support those families in third grade by offering um, the possibility of tutoring in Family Resource Centers or reading support groups in Family Resource Centers and trying to bridge that gap, that gap for the third graders um, to get into the middle school years. And I will say the library started reading Boost because of that gap that exists and because they're, the schools are so great at providing so many supports if you reach a certain level, but there are also kids who are maybe not quite at level. And so the library realized that there is a chance and just trying to reach out and how can we support that gap? Because just because even you can still learn to read at level. This is a number, this is a snapshot in time. It doesn't mean that kids are at that level. There are still additional su supports and I think that's where we get creative and how do we support caregivers of eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds as kids go and <laughs> continue into middle school and high school. Um, the goal is to raise a reader, but reading is a lifelong process and we need to continue to, how can we provide the support? So I think there's some creativity and ingenuity that needs to be met, whether it's through tutoring, which is something that I know is brought up for us, but again, it's a capacity issue. How do we provide that support and make sure that people are trained and qualified? There were two other really good questions that came up a couple weeks ago when I was here. And one was, um, we were looking at some data that reflected that um, children of color, that their outcomes in reading and in graduation um, were not as strong as their white counterparts. And I'm wondering if, if someone could talk about maybe one or two specific strategies that we're involved with with the schools to reach kids of color. I just do want to... Do you want me to start it and you finish? Okay. So one thing that we're doing this summer is we are partnering with Mikasa. We've had a partnership with them for years, but this is the first time we'll be um, going in and providing early literacy activities <clears throat> weekly and providing a full summer program, literacy program with Mikasa to try and reach um, Latinx families, and Blanca can talk a little bit more. Yeah, so Mikasa is the former Esperanza, if you guys ever heard of Esperanza. Um, so Mikasa Summer Camp, the runs for five weeks, and we'll be able to go there every Wednesday and do, like Ali mentioned, we've gone there before, but this year it's, we're like literally just involving reading to these kids that might be low on their reading levels, but we don't want to pressure them into thinking, oh, we're in school again. So we're providing incentives, activities, games in, that involve reading into them. So creating that posit positive literacy that they probably have not had before, or if they have, have left it alone. So we're still working and we're creating those activities for this summer camp specifically. I think too, one of the, um, with the LLE and the direction that we want to go forward with it is trying to bring in a little bit more of that input from the cultural liaisons from these school districts. You know, in the conversations that I've had with them, a lot of them are juggling a lot of different roles within their positions. So how do we engage the knowledge that they have and how do we share the information that we, you know, that we have about early reading and literacy so that they can continue to build up some of those relationships with the community. Uh, I think that's also just like a really important thing. That's one of the priorities, I think, moving forward for LLE. I would also add in terms of um, the outreach within the Family Resource Center. So we certainly have um, uh, our cultural navigators who um, help uh, reach out to our Latinx and East African populations um, and certainly early literacy, early education bridging with schools with um, those families is, is, has been and will continue to be a, a population of focus. We certainly know um, our families of color, Latinx families are face, in addition, face complications related to poverty. And so Family Resource Center can help address the bridge to schools, address concrete supports um, moving forward as we continue to engage with um, trusted, I think, community leaders around messaging and then the access to educational supports.
Sorry, I just wanted to add, um, the Mi Casa Summer Camp, most of the staff are teens. So we're also working on going to their staff training. So we can also train the staff on early literacy so they know why the importance of them reading to them in their classrooms during the summer. All right. Um, does any, do you have last burning questions? Anybody on the panel? You can. Last question. <laughs> last question. I, I want to talk a little bit about page 14, the Ed Neglect assessments completed. There's there are two questions I have. In between 17 and 18, we saw a, 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 a bigger increase than we had seen in the prior <clears throat> years. So I don't know if something's changed there that we, for some reason, there was just many more people or kids absent from school. And are these the same kids year over? And if so, are, what's our vision for them? Is there something else we should be doing to try to get them in school? So good question, Cindy. I think there's a, a couple of pieces. Um, if some folks remember back in 2015, 2016, there was a governor's task force on child protection. <laughs> Following that task force, we certainly saw a spike in child protection reports, period. So educational neglect is a, a population of reports, um, and that would be consistent really across all child protection reports. Um, and in terms of other interventions, like are these kids the same kids? I think they may be from year to year, not exclusively, but we certainly see repeat. Um, and I, as we've had in conversations with the board over the last really six months, we are looking at piloting a new, um, what we are calling the PASS program, promoting academic and school success, which is really looking to divert educational neglect reports to a community partner that we're in partnership with, St. David's, that we hope to launch next fall with the idea of do we see different outcomes um, with families by engaging them in a different way outside of government services. All right. Uh, with that, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll return it to you and to the commissioners. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the presentation and for your work with the kids. Uh, colleagues, comments, questions? I'm certain, oh, we, I'm surprised, Commissioner Brown. I, I certainly <laughs> yeah. have a few. Um, thank you. Thank you for your work. Um, lots to do. I, I guess um, one question I have, I have a bunch, but one that I think is important for us to talk about here is, you know, this is one of these areas that we, we know it contributes to the good and health and safety of the county, yet like we've discussed, uh, a lot of the ownership is in the school districts. And I think why we started getting interested in this is because uh, as a county organization, we touch so many children and families before, the, before they see the school district. And I'm wondering, how are we doing on making sure that when a uh, uh, a child under five isn't involved or has a nexus with a county program, whether it be income supports, child protection, um, mental, children's mental health, that we have some kind of record to say, are they screened? Have they gotten screened at age three or at least at age four? And if not, why not? How can we help? So, you know, all this is really great and I'm excited about all this, but where are we at on our own house here? making sure that we're doing all we can do for that. Question number one. <laughs> I, I think we can speak to, well, I can speak to Child Protection Children's <laughs> Services, that uh, conversations about early childhood screening, third grade reading, um, has been just a growing topic for case managers. Education has been something case managers have always attended to ask questions about. But I think as we have a better understanding of the data and the literature behind the importance of screening, um, those become more quality conversations with parents. And so we've had the early um, screening flyer that's put in assessment packets, so to speak. We have the flyers that go out to child care providers. So it is a, a more robust, I think, um, messaging that goes on a case-by-case -case level um, within children's services. 
And I think in addition to that, what we're trying to do in prevention is really work um, directly with case managers about how we can support them in getting kids to screenings. So if that's just a matter of them making referrals um, to Crystal or talking with Crystal and her connecting with the family to connect them with a, a tablet and with that um, early screening, that we will help support the work in that. And I can add that in family home visiting and the follow along program, standardized um, developmental and social emotional screening tools are required performance measures for us. And if uh, children are getting in for their child and teen checkups, they're getting those at their clinic. Um, so it's built into our programs and we could certainly provide you the data on our outcome measures with screenings prior to early childhood screening. Thank you. And one question I've had, I'd have with um, our library connection with Mikasa this summer: uh, Are there are there going to be? And I, and I don't know kind of the the Mikasa format for this summer. Is it is it preschoolers? It's preschool through sixth grade, and then we're also partnering with New Prague Schools in uh, doing monthly <coughs> programs with their summer wrap, which is for grades for ages three to five. Wonderful. So I would hope that we could say okay, at the beginning, this is how many of the kids are screened, and let's get them, let, I hope we can really incorporate that as part of what we're doing there and show that we made, I know we're going to make a difference in so many ways, but maybe we could in that way, because I understand a lot of times we're giving the information, we're encouraging, but this might be an opportunity to be like, with a, a certain group, can we really move a dial? Um, and maybe I'm missing a reason that can't, you know, happen, but I hope it can. Um, and then I guess I just, I challenge us all to think about all this good work, all these things you've talked about, amazing things, yet in Shakopee we still have, you know, a pretty dismal screening rate, and we have a pretty dismal third grade reading rate, even though all this good work and this attention is going on. So I think that's next step is why, because this, we didn't just start working on this yesterday. And what, what more do we need to do to, to change that? Um, and I know we've had some discussions and more cooperation with the schools and working together, but that's, that's kind of, I like to leave it with, what, what's the next step? That's the next step because we, in some of our communities, we see some real great growth and some good statistics. I know different communities, different numbers of people, different populations, but I think we gotta focus on, on where the numbers are the worst and let's make a difference because otherwise we're doing all this and it's fun and feels good but I, I think you're making a difference let's show it let's show it so thanks that's all I'll save my rest for pesky emails <laughs> <laughs> you act like you've <laughs> well Commissioner Brecky thank you for your attention to this and for your good-natured uh, uh, response to my uh, Josh and with you about this I really do admire the the way you pay attention to these things uh, other colleagues, commissioners, anything to add? I've got a couple of questions, but I'll wrap up with those. I see Commissioner Beer. Thank you very much. Uh, give me a little grace on this. I'm going to ask the question of, is this marker, the third grading reading proficiency, is it the silver bullet? I think it's the only assessment that's being used. The KIPP assessment. So, so maybe. So, so maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I see a lot of lateral movement, not a lot of um, what would be better. And so, as part of me, like I said, give me grace. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a jerk about that. I'm just like, is it, is this the thing? Is this the holy grail, capital H, small h? I don't know. Um, we talk a lot about it, as Commissioner Brecky talked about. We, we've been doing a lot of work in this area. We had uh, a little bit of a report on this a couple weeks ago or a week ago or whatever it was. And it's just like, golly, like, come on. What's, that's just a general statement, not you just happen to be here, but like, what are we doing? Um, and then we look at page eight, which was also on that report of a week or two or three ago, whenever it was, Chris, that you gave us the performance indicators. Uh, page eight. So the first question is, is this the silver bullet? And if it's not, what is? If it isn't, okay, let's just deal with it. Um, I get mandates. We have to deal with mandates all the time. And <laughs> the un 
unfunded portion also we have to deal with uh, often here. So mm -hmm. <laughs> they're good at doling. But if it's something's important, we find a way. So my question is, is this important? Does it really tell us what we need to be told? If not, like whatever the answer is, let's deal with it. Like I don't care. Page eight, percent of third grade students reading standards. We all know we're trending down. So what? So that's not good. But again, if it's not a silver bullet, so what? I think it might be it is, but maybe it's not. But the statewide, if I'm reading that correctly, the state goal is in the brown, orange, whatever you call that color. Is that also trending down or are my old eyes deceiving me? I think I know the answer, but I just want to make sure. So now something that's so important, and here's the standard. Well, we're not quite meeting it, so let's just trend it down. So maybe that makes no sense to me. That is similar to coming and telling me we're low in COVID, but the next page we're high in COVID. I don't think that's the goal. I think that's the actual statewide percentage, correct? Yeah. So what's the what's the goal? Isn't it we always see these reports and we always see the statewide, you know, that's kind of the sort of the yardstick that we're being measured against. I think the goal would be for 100 percent of your kids to be screened. That is the statewide performance. It is ticking down just like our county performance. So what are we doing? Yeah. We did you know, that we, as a rhetorical question. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I mean, well, well, no, no, because we we when you gave us that, when was that? Two weeks ago? We have a, a school district representative in here, which, you know, it's only been a week or two. Um, and I know there's some things happening at scale, hopefully engage more. You know, we've got an army of people in here. Like this is one of the fullest delivers I've seen uh, in a while with people with ready to take on the world. Um, I just feel like, I just need the answer. Is it the silver bullet? And if it is, great then we need to double down. If it isn't, then what is? Just because someone says that this is something we need to do, like I don't, I hate to say it, I'm a little bit of a rule follower, don't let that out. Uh, shoot, I was on green, so that's out. Um, but if a rule doesn't quite make sense, like let's be bold and change it. So that's all I've got at the moment. Well, if Mr. Chair. For an education committee meeting at the legislature, you would realize uh, the what is involved in that? It's it's a big deal. It is a big deal. For a lot of people who yep. are classroom presidents and know how to raise their kids. Danny, you were going to say something, and I saw I, something in the audience. Well, I didn't know if Commissioner Beer wanted kind of the a response, and I don't know if it's a full response. I don't know if it's the silver bullet or if there's a better indicator out there to say this is what's really going to move for us, but I do believe that historically we've seen this as a good indicator of graduation in the past. Um, I think there's a long trend line on this. We're screening at age three and someone's not graduating till 18. So there's a 15 year gap in the data as well um, from that there. Um, I also think what we showed with some of the public health data was that children who are screened at age three do have an increase in their third grade reading level. And those who didn't did not have that. Um, so there is some at least correlation in the data that we're seeing. The, the, the 15 year gap can be a little hard to pick apart. And I think we've been working on, based on the commissioner's questions and desires in the past, to try and track that data better over that time period. So can we, we can look at these snapshots a little bit better and say, we screened at H3 for this cohort at this percent, this is what we saw at third grade, and then this is what we saw in graduations. Right now we're taking big broad trends and trying to get to that data. But when you're looking at a 15 year time frame, there's a lot of variability in what we're seeing from one year to the next and, and trying to read the tea leaves of what happened there. Um, so we are trying to do better at that. I know public health is doing a lot of work to try and capture that data. Um, but to the, the, the soul of the question, I don't know if anybody knows what the silver bullet answer is. And the hard part is it takes 15, 18 years to figure out whether that was the right thing to target on or whether it wasn't. Well, and certainly I think um, if you look at the <coughs> third grade, what third grade is usually eight or nine in there. So if you look at um, those 2014, 15 kids, those are probably our graduates now, right? Mm -hmm. Where they, we have a pretty high graduation rate. So it'll be interesting. Again, I think Danny's correct. You, it, the problem is if you have this time, it'll be interesting to look in about that nine to 10 years, what those graduations are after we have just experienced what we've experienced through the pandemic. 
and some of those um, seem down. Um, I, I think about that question that you just being on the LLE group and is that the silver bullet is that we should do? And I often go back to, I think what Commissioner Brecky said, what's the why in there? I think that is an indicator. It tells us something. I think there's a lot of other things in there about, about the why and what are, what's going on with those families, those kids, et cetera, that we also have to get to in order to answer that question. Okay. Before. If, if I may say, uh, I mean, that's that's exactly it, is, is what is the why? So we have this mandate, you know, we all have marching orders and, and this and that, and sometimes it can be mechanical. Like we have to do this thing, we have to pull this lever, we have to, you know, so trying to stay engaged is really hard because we are measuring things over decades in some cases mm -hmm. or, or certainly close to it. But we have been doing it a while. So you kind of hope that you see more incremental I get things can be slow like I, I'm okay if it's slow as long as we're like you know we're moving the needle and I know COVID I mean how do you plan for that I, so I, I get all of those things so I'm just we're all in this thing together so I hope it's not coming across like I'm just like sheesh there's something better let's find it and do it or how do we stay engaged with I mean look at this you got three rows of people in here on this side of it I mean that's that's there, that's engagement yeah Mr. Chair, if I may, I know I know we need to wrap up, but I think it's important to point out that this isn't a mandate on us. This is something that this this board, before you and I were here at least even, said, we're concerned about this. We believe it impacts the quality of life in Scott County. And that's unusual for this board, right? Um, so we, we are interested, we are engaged, we have been putting resources here. So I, I think, we, I agree, as much as I love this work, and you all know I'm, I'm here, but I, I want it to be sustainable, we need to figure out how we're changing that, or if all this work is doing something else that also is important. And that could be, because, yeah, I can't stand to see that half of third graders can't read at their level. But may I don't I think we have a lot of questions here that hopefully we're right at about the time to answer and figure out what this is doing and if we need to do more of it or if we did our best. Yeah. There's there's a lot on the table here for really, really good or to move on. And I hope we're not moving on. But I think it's important to say this is one thing we're not mandated to do. We're not mandated to do anything with this, mm -hmm. but we care, we think it's right for the community. Mm -hmm. So just, I think I'm just telling us that, but you all heard it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Chris, you wanted to jump in, then I'm going to go to Commissioner Howard. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted, I, uh, it's unfortunate that Lisa Brodsky was not able to be here today mm -hmm. uh, because she helped design this data sharing uh, research project with Chakopee, which will provide a second look at the data, uh, like a five year look back instead of a 15 year look forward. Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to have access to some data in a more timely way. Um, it's a different data set, right? But we're gonna be getting some feedback um, that we're not gonna have to wait 15 years for as that data project goes forward. And you'll be hearing more about that data project as we go too. Okay. Um, it may help us either ask better questions or maybe answer a few. Commissioner Ulrich, thank you for your question. Well, presentation. I don't know how you define <laughs> silver bullet, first of all. But well, I, I would say if you can't read, standard you're in serious better. trouble throughout your mm -hmm. whole life. If you went over to the jail and did a reading test, mm -hmm. you could probably gather some insight on how important it is to be able to read. You'd, the reading scores over there would not be not be good. I wouldn't uh, rest and say, hey, we got a problem at third grade, but obviously at a senior in high school we don't because 90% graduate. I gotta tell you, when I was in high school, I don't know anybody that did not graduate. I don't know anybody that got, ever got held back in a grade. I don't know how rigorous Graduation really is you're graduating a lot of people that really can't read really can't write I wouldn't rest on that um, That the idea that problem solved 90% graduate. I don't believe that for a second. So um, That's just my comments and I I guess I'm wondering should we be confident that what you're talking about measures to take doing for forward Should we be confident that a shock people will jump up 40 40 points to be where they you know Where some of the leaders are in our county? I mean Should we be confident? Or not that there that there's going to be real change here. Thank you. 
Rhetorically, um, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for your presentation. I just have a couple of uh, closing suggestions and comments. The, uh, um, I think the setting of the, the, the silver, not, silver bullet isn't the word the commissioner was looking for. It's the standard. Well, the gold standard. Why did reading at third grade become a gold standard we all measure? I've been around long enough to remember some of the arguments about what we're doing with the kids, whose responsibility they are, how do we measure them, and there's a whole thing about the parents saying, these are my kids, and the state saying, but we got mandatory attendance because we want to create the model citizen or whatever. Those raging value debates go on in politics all the time. You're dealing with that today, stuff that's gone for 25, 30 years ahead of you. Remember when I was the Shockby City Council member liaison of the, Scott, or the Shockby School Board, sitting in those meetings for hours on end some nights, listening in to debate uh, to see what was all the rage back in the 1990s. It was, oh, everybody had to be affirmed. Everybody's self-esteem. That was the hot button at the time. It was self-esteem. And it seems like every four or five years, the new hot button issue comes along. And everybody in the educational white ivory tower in St. Paul or Washington comes up with a new idea. And <clears throat> one of my favorite economists, human nature experts, is a guy who's passed on now. His name is Walter Williams. Look up Walter Williams and you know, read some of his work. You'll understand the incredible wisdom we lost when Walter Williams passed. But one of the things he liked to look at was what the government did, how it affected people, and how if it turned out to be the wrong idea, Eh, you moved on to the next thing. It was just water over the dam, and the collateral damage was what the rest of us had to pick up. So social scientists can pick up great ideas, run with them. Turns out that every kid getting a trophy and nobody ever getting told they were wrong has created an enormous problem for us today, 15 years later. <laughs> but who's accountable for that? Been there, done that. Now we're on to the next educational hot button, and you guys get to try to deal with it because we don't make the rules here. We have to live with what comes down from St. Paul or Washington. And these are people that are really smart and probably have the best of intentions, but we end up trying to fix it, trying to make it work. So the third grade reading standard seemed to be the lowest common denominator we could all agree on that had some measure of effectiveness when it came to measuring things. We couldn't talk about leadership skills. We couldn't talk about how they parted their hair or how well they could diagram a sentence. Those things all kind of sifted down to the common denominator was how well do they read at third grade. And I think for a while we tested them again in eighth grade because that was another standard that I think has kind of fallen by the wayside. My question is why didn't we ever test for math? Math is pretty value neutral and that's also a pretty important deal but somehow in the scheme of things testing for math at the third grade level was nothing that was ever latched onto and we can have a long debate about that. My last question of you, and it'll be rhetorical at this time, but the next time we get back here, I'd like to hear some data on the effect that homeschooling and private schools have on this data that you're showing us. I have a hunch that if we broke that category out, those kids would be off the charts. Is that aggregated in the data we're seeing here today, or is this just public school data that's really important because I think there may be a germ of an idea on how we can really rock these scores if we think about how we deliver education. And that's all I'll say about that. Chris and team, thank you for your work on this. Thanks for the time you put in and the data you gave us and the good discussion today to my colleagues. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you very much.